BBUR. This is Dick Lair, closest to me. This is David Bowery, next to him. And I want to just introduce a few other people who are in the room. Uh, Harvey Silverglate is standing up in the back, about to sit down. Uh, well-known lawyer in the Boston area. Peter Gelsenis, Boston Herald reporter, a, a columnist in the back corner as well. Um, who else do we have out here? Charlie Kravitz, our general manager, standing up by the door. Charlie has been here about two and a half years, and one of the things he's done is create something called the, the iLab, the Idea Lab, or the Innovation Lab. This project that David has done is something he was able to do through the iLab, where he was able to be detached for a while from his regular beat to do this kind of project, which is really great. Um, Lisa Tobin is our innovation producer who is really key in this, but I think she's now slaving away in, in front of a laptop somewhere because this website launches tomorrow morning. Um, who else do I want to point out in the room? Susan Gray. Where is Susan? Susan is with Northern Lights Production, which made a movie called Making of a Monster. It's part of Discovery Investigations, which is a branch of the Discovery Channel. And Susan, do you want to introduce the folks you brought with you? And this movie was based on uh, Dick's book. Am I right about this? Exactly. Dick's first book. Dick has another book out right now. Exactly. All right. So we'll have everyone out in time to hear that. So originally, Shelley Murphy of the Boston Globe was going to be with us, too. But there was today, the Bulger trial starts tomorrow, jury selection. Today was the final pre-trial hearing, which ran all day long. I think it went till after 5 o'clock today. Yeah. So we got a note till 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So they were hashing out all these final issues. You know, can the uh, lawyers talk to the press during the trial? Uh, can the medical examiner, uh, what I think it was, they, they were going to allow the medical examiner to testify about all 19 right. alleged murder yep. victims. So we got a call from Shelley saying it had run so long that she had to frantically go back to the Globe, write her story for tomorrow, so we don't have Shelley. But even without Shelley here, between Dick and David, they're sort of literally collectively decades worth of <laughs> reporting and coverage Almost about... 100 years between us, right? <laughs> Exactly. That must be 70 for you, right? <laughs> Dick wrote a really, really amazing and riveting book called Black Mass. Some of you may have read with Jerry O'Neill, former Spotlight team editor. Dick and, and uh, Jerry have a new book out right now. David has covered legal and criminal issues and, and Whitey Bulger for, for decades as well and has done this amazing project that we'll hear a lot about. So I want, because we have a small enough group, I want to give everyone a chance to ask questions later. I think it's a great opportunity when you have these experts here to be able to do that. But one thing I want Dick and, and David to do for us first is just talk about the scale of this trial. I mean, it's an extraordinary amount of evidence. It's scores of witnesses. It's I think the jury poll starts with 675 people that need to be winnowed down to between 12 and 18. And something I think, I think it's estimated to last at least three months. Can the two of you give us some sense of scale here? You want to start? Sure. Uh, the numbers are all, the numbers are all, the numbers, thank you, sir. The numbers are all staggering. Uh, there are over 400,000 documents that are involved, 123 uh, 123 captured uh, telephone calls of varying lengths, uh, videos. That in itself is, is, is stunning. It, it, it encapsulates a period, well, when you put it this way, when you begin to look at Whitey Bulger and his first, first uh, elect, his first, excuse me, his first arrest, it's closer to the Spanish-American War than it is to today. <laughs> so you are just, there's vast, vast scales. Uh, 19 murders, uh, over 180 witnesses are going to be there at trial, potentially to be used. So it is just, it's just vast in scope. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when, in writing his biography, one of the things uh, we discovered or, or we realized or came into focus was that when you write about uh, Whitey Bulger, uh, you're basically writing about the 20th century. He's been around so long. Uh, a survivor in a field where people don't survive very long, usually at all. Uh, and so now at, at trial, there's this, you know, obviously the prism of a racketeering case, but it is huge. It's enormous, as David was just saying. Uh, we're not talking about a single murder or a single case of bank robbery. We're talking about something that went on for decades, uh, uh, you know, uh, a racketeering uh, crime boss, kingpin, and, and crime boss, uh, and involved in it, which makes it, I think, all the more fascinating and historic, is, is the role of the FBI in, in it. Uh, and you cannot talk about Whitey Bulger without, in the same breath, 
talking about the FBI. I, I call this the longest running saga in the English language. <laughs> there is there is there is nothing longer than this, and it's it's it. You know, we even have like the true sagas that begin in Iceland. We even have Icelanders in this saga, yeah. so <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. Well, and as, as Dick just touched on, this is not just Whitey Bulger on trial. I mean, I think it very much is the FBI on trial. And a lot of people have, you know, speculated, would the FBI have preferred that Whitey not have been found? You know, did the FBI help Whitey not be found for so long because of what this stirs up about the agency's relationship with him? You know, to what degree do the two of you feel like this is just going to be an, a, a quite embarrassing, could there be anything more embarrassing left to be heard about the FBI and its relationship that hasn't already been written about? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> because that's good material. No, as a, well, no, as also as a citizen. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, what should concern us all uh, as, as citizens, never mind journalists trying to cover a story, is uh, the role of the FBI in this epic scandal. Uh, and while a lot has come out over the years, uh, I mean, again, even the, in the tumbling out of, of what you know the truth here or what really was going on it's we're, we're talking about over a decade now going back to the wolf hearings in 1998 and um, on, on different stages you know lots come out in terms of the FBI participation uh, the band of agents who were involved with, with with Whitey Bulger and Stevie Fleming and whatnot but this is a stage unlike any of the previous ones in which hopefully the public will be able to really focus on Whitey and the FBI in a way that they haven't been able to before, but maybe, I mean, and the defense lawyers, you know, they're really rocking and socking here. Um, so I'm hoping, uh, again, as a citizen, to try to figure out, you know, the scope of this thing, that they can knock loose some, some more information. The, the, problem, the, the, the problem is, Sasha, that uh, the, rulings, the rulings in this case by the presiding judge have all been against the defense. She has ruled routinely against the defense as well as the earlier presiding judge. And what that means is that they're not going to be able to put forward an immunity defense. The immunity defense, however outlandish it might seem to people, was that Bulger had a deal. Conveniently, from the defense standpoint, it was with a, a Department of Justice prosecutor who's dead. Uh, that was convenient, but that he had a deal, and the deal uh, gave him immunity for past crimes, and what is really mind-boggling is the concept of future crimes, which the prosecution derided as license to kill. Had they been able to present that defense, though, they could then talk about what Bulger was getting in return, because everybody knows they were getting something in return. They were protected and they understood they were protected. When they were tipped off about people who were informing against them, they were told, you're being protected. When they murdered people who had come forward to testify against them, and nobody in the FBI ever asked them if they'd murdered anybody or ever interrogated them, it was telling them, they had a deal where they were tipped off that there was a coming, uh, a coming indictment and they were about to be arrested, what would they conclude? They were protected in some way. So unfortunately, the defense has been, uh, the defense of this case has pretty much been st stripped of its intended defenses so you don't get to the big picture. Which brings us really to this idea, Sasha, and it's as somebody that loves the court and loves the law, I always go into these trials expecting and hoping, hoping that truth is going to be revealed. <laughs> and trials really aren't about truth so much. And in this case, uh, we hope that it's going to expand, but I'm not sure you're going to get the accountability that we hope the public gets. Well, if we go back to that immunity defense, because as David s has said, the judge has said it can't be introduced. I mean, that was kind of the linchpin originally of the defense. So what's left for Bulger's defense lawyers if they can't present that immunity defense, or are there ways to sort of sneak it in anyway? Well, I have, there's an, uh, a fair number of FBI agents who will likely testify, and that might be a way in, uh, you know, pounding away and exploring that. That's, that's one way I can think of it. But could that mean constant objections where the judge says to the jury, disregard what you just heard? The, I, I think this, that what's happened is that Carney, having been stripped of, of his main line of defense. This is Jay Carney, Bulger's J. W. main lawyer. J.W. Carney, 
J period W period <laughs> Carney, as he introduces himself, is going to fight over everything. It is going to be in the trenches. They will fight and fight and fight to get something in. And when Bulger takes the stand, uh, as Harvey Silverglade has, has, has said, the judge is going to find it impossible to sanitize the jurors' minds, that sanitize them completely. So, so Carney will try to get in the point that he hopes one or two jurors will get, that there was some sort of a deal, that they were being promised something, that they did things in return for promises. But that, everything is going to be fought for at this trial. And Carney has now said, because he's been stripped of his defense, he is going to stipulate to nothing. So if the prosecution says it's midnight, Carney's reaction is going to be, prove it. Tell us a little bit about some of the, the witnesses, because there could be some sort of epic <coughs> confrontations, right? Some people who haven't seen each other in a long time and have a lot of Dick, issues Dick, to hash Dick, out. Dick, Dick, well, yes. me and Whitey, I guess. <laughs> 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 That's been one. <laughs> well, now that he's behind bars, I've been waiting for that, you know? <laughs> that interview. So who are we going to see on that stand, and, and what kind of questions are we going to hear? Oh, well, I, I mean, it's going to be a really, really big day, fascinating days when Stevie Fleming, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Whitey's longtime partner for so many years, Kevin Weeks. I mean, these are people who were com completely and absolutely trusted for so long, and now they're all, you know, they all, all because they feel betrayed. Uh, you can, and what's Matarano's line? You can't rat on a rat. You can't rat on a rat. Uh, Matarano, yeah. Johnny Deep Matarano. Deep philosophical yeah. argument. <laughs> <that> <laughs> you, you can the, talk um, about. Yeah. So it, th I think the big lineup is is uh, Flemmy, Kevin Weeks, the sidekick, and and the hitman John Matarano is watching them. The courtroom dyma dynamics and the atmospherics. Never mind the content of of the uh, of the testimony, and then Carney's, you know, Whitey's lawyers' uh, cross examination and whatnot. What's 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 interesting here is that these witnesses have already testified. Most of the witnesses will already have testified at trials. Uh, the John Conley's, most of the witnesses in this case have testified at, uh, at both of John Conley's trials previously. The S former, the FBI former agent FBI, now in prison. F FBI agents, right. that's right. Uh, there are, but there are going to be, there are going to be new witnesses here. And, and Flemmy now has, uh, because Flemmy, uh, has his testimony changed over time in that he was protecting himself. He was citing his Fifth Amendment privileges in earlier testimony. Now he has acknowledged that he was involved in the murders. So he is going to be uh, testifying fully. Uh, interestingly enough, Dick, I, I was just, I, I actually was talking to Kevin Weeks today and um, reminded him of the last line in his book, which was brutal. And the last line in Kevin Weeks' book kind of explains uh, his, his, his anticipation of this trial. Because the last line of the book is, I hope they never find him. <laughs> and so I said to him today, I said, still think that way? He said, of course. You think I want to be going through this? <laughs> so he is going to confront uh, his surrogate father and uh, that, and the other one that's going to be phenomenal is John Morris, who was the FBI supervisor of John Conley. He was the one that took money, sought bribes, uh, sought bribes, took money from Bulger. And in 1990, it was 1995, I think, was it, or is it 96, when Bulger was on the road, he, he, made a, he made a phone call. It was the fall. Fall of 96, yeah. 96, he made a phone call to John Morris, who was still on the job. And the, the night that he called John Morris, John Morris went into cardiac arrest, and he quit the FBI. So I'm figuring they're going to have defibrillators in the court. <laughs> now, Whitey Bulger is expected to take the stand, right? Yeah, that's what they're promising, but we've heard that promise before in high-profile trials. Oh, yeah, but he, but, but this but is you, different, you don't you think? You have no doubt. I, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I what mean, happens? Does he spill his guts? Does he, I mean, what happens when you put someone like that up there? Well, I think you're going to hear the world according to Whitey as best as it can come out, which we've seen some previews, which is things like I've never been an informant. Um, I think if you, again, you study his life or if, like someone like Peter Gazilnison here has been writing about this, I mean, this is a guy who, who's, whether it's him coming from his himself or his handlers or his family, 
I'm, I'm not as bad as people make me out to be. Um, that's, what, that's what the Whitey line has been from back to his teenage years. Um, and it's all about the press getting, trying to get at my brother Billy and stuff like that. And so this latest iteration is, I didn't kill those girls, Flemmy did. It's not, I'm not the monster that, that everyone makes me out and to Dick, be. Dick, you were, you were onto that, you were onto that story early, that the other tag that you use, the good bad guy. Why don't you explain yeah, that? Yeah, the good, I mean, that's, that's, that's his self persona, this narcissism that goes into being a psychopath and everything else. They can look you in the eye, lying through their teeth, and not blink and, and sound as believable as possible. And depending on the situation, that's what historically he has done. And, and the latest, and it's, and again, it, it's really, I, I mean, I'm, because we're like, we're, we're trained to suspend belief, show me, show me the proof. But the, the idea that I have never, I'm not an informant for the FBI, you know, and he can, uh, Does I, he that have blows my mind. Yeah. Does I mean, he have that's, a sort of th a there's a Mount Everest of information to the contrary. But that doesn't matter to him, well, Sasha. Yeah. I look at you, and I've never been an FBI informant. But this is, but you know, this is what Carney has done during this trial, and I have to hand it to him. It's like everything you thought you knew about Bulger is wrong. Let me, I'll, I'll play the counter to that, and it's very consistent. Uh, Conley before, John Conley before he was arrested, before he was charged and before he was arrested, said in the late, teen, late 1990s, here was the deal, he always made it clear to us, he was not an informant. He said at the beginning, this is Conley, at the time saying it, he wasn't, he didn't have, risk anything at the time Conley was saying it, he never wanted to be considered an informant. He said, I'm not going to screw my friends, I'm not an informant, I'll be a consultant or I'll be this you might say Liaison, strategist, you, you might person. say you might say he's engaging he's engaging in euphemisms here but follow this but continuing this in 1980 the FBI supervisor who was brought to Boston for the purposes of checking Bulger out went to meet with him came back wanted him scrubbed didn't like him and what did he write in his report the guy says he's not an informant the guy says he's not an informant, he's not going to inform on his friends. Connolly is quoted by John Morris, his supervisor, as telling Morris the first time they went out, don't call him an informant. He's not an informant. He is our consultant. So, so there's a certain consistency, there's a certain consistency here to what he was saying that, that and finally, most people, and you, I wonder if you disagree. Most most agents, most people involved, say that say that Fle that uh, uh, Whitey Bulger never gave them anything of any significance that led to any significant prosecutions. That all the good stuff was coming from the real, legitimate informant, and the best one Boston FBI ever had, Fleming. So you wonder: is there something there? So why did the FBI continue that relationship for so long if it didn't yield as much as they hoped it would? Now, that's a common sense question to be asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we all, that's what we all, what, that's what we all well, said that, to Carney. Yeah, and there's so many strands to that. It's about John Conley and his ambition and loyalty and Southie yeah. and with the Bulger and Whitey Bulger family. And, and like, yeah, I mean, David's working with, with what we do know. Whitey was an informant. I think the record shows he was an informant, but he was a lousy informant when it comes to bringing down the Angelos. They didn't need him. But it doesn't mean he wasn't an informant. Mm. Uh, and, you know, all, and, and it's all true he didn't want to be called an informant, a liaison co uh, consultant. And to me, that's John Conley being so deferential, and, and that's a, a reveal on, on really who's in charge of this relationship. If the FBI handler is saying, oh, don't ca call him Mr. Bulger, you know, don't ever call him Whitey, <laughs> call him Jim, and he's not an informant. Uh, it just shows, like, who's in charge uh, uh, in this situation. And from what, you know, if you put yourself, it, I, actually, I, I shouldn't have said that, put yourself in Whitey's shoes. I don't think anyone wants to get into it. <laughs> but uh, how he was treated and, and the protection he received, um, in his own mind, yeah, he, I, I, he can say I wasn't an informant and, and I have an, an immunity at the same time because I was a liaison, I was a consultant, um, and they protected me. I think that's how they're, he's going to try to, in his mind, his experience. But, the, 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 but is know, that law? I don't think that's lawful. I don't think, uh, but the, I don't think in a you know, society runs by the rule of law, I don't think uh, you can, can translate his life experience 
as a protected FBI informant by a band of corrupt agents into a kind of legal immunity that acquits you from this horrible lifetime of crime. Right. And, and the final piece of this, Sasha, is that last September, uh, Whitey was talking to his brother, Jack, and of course, the phone calls are recorded. Everybody knows the phone calls are recorded, and if you don't, there's a voice in the background breaking in. <laughs> this phone call is recorded. <laughs> so, but, so Bulger probably was very, he, I mean, this, he, he's, he's brighter than the average bear, that's for sure. He knew he was being recorded, but what he said to his brother was very telling. And he, he started off, uh, effing John Conley. I'm looking at all these effing reports. I never gave him anything. I bought information. I never gave anything to him. Nothing. Nothing. So here he is, again, perhaps making the record. It's, it's striking, though, that he's throwing Conley under the bus, the last guy who was the last guy living by the wise guy code of not rolling on anybody. Bulger threw him under the bus as well. Right, but a very hey, tactical I, phone call. Yeah, right, I mean, right. I don't think the significance of Whitey's now turning on Conley and throwing him aside as if he's, he's so disposable uh, has, has really been truly captured or illuminated. Uh, I think that's huge. Um, Conley has, uh, is spending the rest of his life in prison because of his loyalty to Whitey Bulger going back years now. Um, they tried to make, you know, when he was indicted, was it early 2000 for the first time? For mo more than a decade, the tr government has sought to, to get him to cooperate, to turn, and, and so they can go deeper uh, into the whole story. Never, never. You know, I was, you know, he's, ne he's never done anything wrong. Whitey was my, you know, the FBI's informant. We brought down the mafia. He stayed, stayed on point. The fact that Whitey now, for purposes of making the record and starting to do what he was doing, can just discard him so fast and so easy. Again, I think captures so so centrally um, that narcissism. And it's yeah. all about him all the time. And when and if necessary, he would do that. And and people like it makes me think of Catherine Gregg, in in a way. I've thought you know because people talk about their time in Santa Monica. Some people have talked about it as like a love story. Um, I, I don't know. After studying Whitey Bulger's life, I don't quite see it that way. Yeah, they were compatible. And there was certainly a relationship there, but he needed her. And, and I so got to think that the, if, she, if he, if she ever turned on him, you know, if she, if he ever needed to, oh yeah. uh, you know, to to dispose of her in the same way he's done that with Conley, he would in an instant. Well, to, to give you an idea of her disposability, so to speak, he, she was the one that was getting all the medications from the drugstore. She was the one that was on the TV monitors. He wasn't going out to do it. Yeah. But there's a, you know, if you've ever seen. I wasn't a big fan of The Departed, but there was a fabulous Chinese version of that yeah. called Infernal Affairs. And it's really a knockoff of the, of the Chinese film that's fabulous. And there's one great, great line in that movie. It's from a Scottish poet. And the line is, how many millions had to die to make Caesar great? And, and, and Peter, his mind, the culture of South Boston. But when you think of how many millions died for Caesar to be great, and you look at all the people in this story, the FBI agents that disgraced themselves, that were corrupted, the people who died, the collateral damage that the FBI considered collateral damage, all those people, whether criminals or innocents that died along the way, and you had the most loyal of all the soldiers, John Conley, who at the end gets thrown under the bus. And you say, for what? What kind of a Caesar? A guy that screwed everybody, moved to Santa Monica, lived behind black plastic windows, watched televisions and complained about blacks and school busing that was like 40 years old? I mean, that's what this was for? And it's, it's just the, the scope of it is, is just stunning. I, I, has anyone heard Conley's reaction to, to you know, Whitey's claims? Uh, I, that I, always I, I, he calls me and writes me. I haven't heard on that, but because that's such a huge point. Because what, what does this, he make of it? The, what, what, what makes this more dramatic is that Conley, who is really you know, Conley was, say what you will about Conley, he's the only FBI agent who ever went 
to jail. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no justice as long as he's the only one there. But he's there, and he's in a hell hole. They threw him into solitary for 51 days because he spoke to somebody over the phone that he wasn't uh, authorized to speak to. But he told that reporter, hey, my sources are telling me that the first thing Whitey said when he was arrested was John Connolly had nothing to do with that murder in, in Florida. He had, had nothing to do with it. And so Connolly was talking as if, here again, his pal was going to come in and rescue him like the white knight, which only makes what, what, what he said all the more stunning. Is it possible that if Whitey is on the stand, what we'll hear is that he has like a Robin Hood view of himself and his role in, in Southie? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, he has spun his own story, and he sees it his way. Uh, and I don't know if he'll ever, I mean, if he'll, how he'll characterize it, but he'll, he'll consider himself a benevolent, uh, you know, cr uh, underworld crime boss or whatever. I sort of like to think that I've interviewed I've interviewed Whitey because I talked to the guy that talked to him for 17 <laughs> hours in the hospital uh, when, he, when he came into the hospital. And so this guy, uh, the, the source that I spoke to, was with him. And he said, <laughs> and he was not abused, the guy never stopped talking. He wouldn't shut up. <laughs> he talked all night long, for God's sakes. And I said, what did he say? And he, you know, he said, he said a couple of things. He's, when, he gets to the, when he takes the stand, he's not going to hurt anybody who was on his side. He's not going to hurt any of his friends. And I said, OK, that's interesting. And he said, and you know, he was telling me, I got this, I, I'm noticing I have a short-term memory problem, but my long-term memory is great. And so, I mean, he's, he, is, he is going to live to settle scores. That's, that's, as Kevin Weeks once said, he used to, Kevin Weeks, they were big fans of movies like The Heat uh, and Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. And he said, Bulger used to say, let's all go to hell. You know, when the big moment comes, let's all go to hell together. And so this is his moment. Uh, but he, 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 he's playing for history. You know, what almost gets lost in this story is that this is ultimately a murder trial for 19 people. I mean, it's such a soap opera that we forget that this is about 19 people who died and are believed to have died because of Bulger directly or indirectly. And, you know, I, Dick, I think before I worked at BUR, I worked at The Globe, and I remember one day, I think it was Carson Beach, this must have been about a decade ago, that suddenly they were digging up Carson Beach. Maybe you remember this. Mm -hmm. They had some tip about a body, and for me, that made it seem real in a way that it, it hadn't before, that here, all these years later, they were trying to find a body that Whitey Bulger might have been responsible for killing. What are we going to hear from witnesses' family members? Or is there likely to be testimony from them? I mean, there's been debate about how much they can say. Will they be in the courtroom? I imagine some want nothing to do with it. Some want to be there every day of it. Well, I think that was one of the developments today is, is how the scope of the testimony of the, of the um, victims' families and, in, in you know, however many they bring in in connection with the 19 murders. Um, if whether, and I think it's restricted to the, so the quote unquote facts. It, it, as it, the, yeah, as yeah. it should be. Yeah. A, as it should be. So we're not going to we're not going to hear at the trial what the, so much what these families went through. But I talked to most of the families over the years, and for the last three months, I I intended I said to my goal was to talk to all the families, and I have to tell you, it was it. It, it was it was stunning to hear these stories, and I come away from it, and it humbled and and just reminded that you cannot that Bulger himself is a small figure, a really a small figure. He's a criminal, but what made this case singular is that the government, as government policy, protected him, and they protected him while he killed people, and the government knew that. And they knew, and those people were collateral damage. And the stories I've heard from, from people it have been truly stunning. A lot of the victims were criminals. And a number of the victims killed other people. But you realize in the sort of the perversity of human nature, nature, I guess, people can be wonderful fathers, wonderful, wonderful providers, and they can also, we know, we can also they can also strangle the fathers of other people's children. 
However, their families, and you sort of see, I've, I've seen the damage that was done. Um, I just, I, I talked to Paul McGonigal, whose, whose father, Paul McGonigal, was, was murdered and disappeared. Uh, family had no idea. They presumed that he was gone, but they, did, but they didn't know. And um, Paul was 14 at the time. Paul McGonigal Jr. was 14 at the time. Uh, a couple of years before his father was murdered, Whitey Bulger uh, shot his uncle at point blank range. His uncle was a non-combatant. This, uh, this is a striking part of the movie, The Making of a Monster. Um, he's 14 years old. His father is gone. They don't know who did it. How do you survive in that situation? What do you do? Who are your friends? They're in Southie. And all of a sudden, Whitey Bulger comes up to him in the street. He knows Whitey Bulger. Whitey Bulger had been his father's friend. Bulger tells him, he says, listen, I don't want you to worry about anything. We took care of the guy that took care of your father. That is just chilling. Um, because we have a small enough crowd, I want to open it up to the floor a little bit. I also want to point out David Frank from Mass Lawyers Weekly is here. And I think, David, you'll be covering this trial. Will you be there, will you be there for the duration? I, well, I'm, I'm just trying to follow Mr. Boweri. <laughs> <laughs> David's been a great David's been a great friend. We've worked together. We've collaborated, uh, BUR and Mass Lawyers Weekly. So yeah. Uh, David Frank, Peter Galtzenis, Harvey Silvergley. Anything the three of you want to add that you, that you're interested in seeing? That your thoughts about this trial from your journalism legal perspectives? I, I, I was I was uh, keying in on the last part about the victims. I think a couple of things. I kind of wonder if they're prepared. <coughs> Maybe they are. I mean, David's done a lot of research with them. For, for what they're going to hear? For, yeah, well, not only for what they're going to hear, but I think, I think Whitey, in, in a general sense, will cast them as being in the light, this idea that, you know, I mean, I think over the past couple of years with, with Whitey coming back and some of his dealings, particularly in the last two years with him being back, some of them have gotten an incredible amount of cameras. The unflattering ways he may classify their and their and dead relatives. He's already tried to distance himself from the murders of the two women. He did so. Um, I think that's going to be that's going to be an interesting. Uh, I have a curiosity question. I, I I think it's mostly been through Jay Carney that. It seems that Whitey is sort of vociferously saying, I did not kill those two women. Is that because there's some sort of, is that to cross a line to kill women? I mean, why, why in particular would he push back on that? I mean, if you know, I mean, you two gentlemen know some of the stories too. I mean, he seems to take great relish in it. I mean, the, story, the stories that, that, that I heard, and I'm sure they've heard, is that Fleming didn't have the stomach to do it. And he did, and in a, <laughs> in a very twisted, almost sexual way. So. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how he backs away from that. And, and the dynamic of what happens when Flemmy gets on the stand, that's going to be, that'll be electric because, because he'll have to confront that. Yeah, that, that is, I mean, because we're talking about... Because both women are connected to Stevie, so... so we're, yeah. we're talking about the, uh, we're talking about the, uh, the Irish Robin Hood. Right. Uh, and the, cult, the, the figure of the Irish Robin Hood, the guy... The guy that, that stops his car to help, to help the little old lady cross the street and brings uh, Christmas turkeys, turkeys to the right. nuns is not the same guy that murders women, or maybe it is, but it does, it's not consistent with the pattern. Uh, yeah, and by the way, the other person I spoke to here, and, and the, another one of the victims, Billy St. Croix is the son of of Stephen Fleming. And Billy St. Croix had a situation in 1999 because he realized that Deborah, Deborah Hussey went missing. That was his stepsister. His stepsister, uh, his, his father had begun raping his stepsister before, when, when, when she was a child. And she went, he went, she went missing. In 1999, he went to the jail uh, where his father was. His father mouthed the words because he didn't want to be heard and he didn't want it, it seen. He drew a map uh, <clears throat> to where the guns were between the Fleming household and the Bill Bulger household and he wanted them to get rid of them. 
and so he got rid of all the guns. Uh, on January 14th, 2000, armed with search warrants, the state police arrived at the Fleming House to get the guns. They weren't there. They'd been moved by Billy Say Croy. But they had better luck later on the day. They went over to Dorchester and they found the bodies, the bones that Kevin Weeks had told them they'd find there. And amongst the set of remains were Deborah Hussey. It, 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 it resulted in Billy St. Croix going to the Plymouth jail and saying to his father, did you kill my sister? To which his father said, yeah, but I can explain. And from that, from that moment, from, 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 from that moment, he was a different man, Billy St. Croix. He eventually brought the cops to the guns. He had the guns, he had brought them out of state to hide them. He brought them to the guns, testified against his father, and oh, by the way, 1999, that same year, his sister committed suicide and left a note accusing her father of raping her as well. Will Billy so, testify at this trial? Yeah, he's, he's, he's coming, I talked to him. I mean, an amazing story, he said, he was talking to his father the last time he saw his father, and his father said to him, hey, looking good, and then he realized his father wanted to kill him and might be planning to. So. I have a question for Harvey Silverglate. Uh, the judge in this case, Denise Casper, was introduced to it relatively recently because the previous judge was removed because of an appearance of a conflict or a conflict, however you want to look at it. This is a somewhat untested judge. I think she was only confirmed to the bench in December 2010. Any concerns that she may be over her head for the scale of this? Well, I think it would have been better if a more experienced judge got the case. Uh, I think she's clearly uh, not ready for it, but she drew the case, and she's going to have to uh, rise to the occasion. So far, she has not risen to the occasion. She has managed to eviscerate or attempt to eviscerate the defense. Uh, whether she's going to be skillful enough to actually uh, eviscerate it in practice, that is, as the case goes on. There's a very skillful defense lawyer here, too, very skillful defense lawyers, and it's going to be a game, basically, not so much between them and the prosecutors, but a game between the defense lawyers and the judge to see how much of the immunity defense the lawyers are going to be able to slip in uh, past the judge when she's maybe not looking. So I think that's really what this is going to be about. Um, I think that uh, uh, actually uh, 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 David uh, is a little too hard on the defense in the case. Uh, when he, for example, I think I caught him saying uh, that uh, Carney uh, and Bulger claimed that the deal, the immunity deal, uh, including murder, was made with Jeremiah O'Sullivan, I think I heard you say, David, who was conveniently dead as if they selected <laughs> O'Sullivan because he was not going to be in a position, as far as we know, to testify uh, to the contrary. But in fact, it's very logical that they would say it was O'Sullivan. O'Sullivan was the one guy who was in the driver's seat who, if anybody in the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Department of Justice, was going to make the deal, it would have been O'Sullivan uh, because of his position, and I happen to know Jerry O'Sullivan. I dealt with him when he was a prosecutor. I wouldn't put it past him actually to have made such a deal. Whether he meant it or not is something else. But prosecutors say things all the time to people to get them to cooperate. They don't necessarily mean them. So I wouldn't be so cynical about the claim that the deal was made with with Jerry O'Sullivan, uh, that, that's number I'm one. I'm going to jump to David's defense. I, I, everything, I agree with what you're saying, Harvey, but he's still conveniently dead today. <laughs> <laughs> David, David Frank, Mass Lawyers <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> he's, he is dead. We could stipulate he's dead. <laughs> you were, were you there today for the pretrial yeah. hearing? Yeah. And there's no question he is still dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judge Casper and, and Jay Carney had, they had an exchange um, this afternoon about this very issue. The, the, the government stood up at one point and was essentially called Jay Carney's witness list a bogus witness list and made the point that most of the witnesses that he put on there, Judge Stearns, uh, Mueller, um, help me Dave, Margolis, yep. there were a bunch of witnesses who the, the government says could only be called if the defense was gonna present information about immunity. The judge reminded Jay that that ruling didn't go his way 
And Jay assured the judge that he understands the ruling and has no intention of arguing anything about immunity. He, didn't, he said, I'm not going to divulge what my defense is. But there was a, an interesting back and forth. So it, if he, I don't think if he's, I, it's going to be hard, I think, for him to sneak in testimony about immunity. So it sounds like today was a foreshadowing of how complicated and messy this could be as, as this goes along. There was a question in the front row, yes. Is there any sympathy for uh, Bulger? Any sympathy for Bulger? Well, uh, there are still some pockets. I think the uh, Dick Cheney coined the phrase dead enders. Uh, <laughs> there are some pockets. But you know, the true sympathy, uh, not sympathy, the true concern we have to have for James Whitey Bulger is that he receive a fair trial. Because what is this worth if it's not going to be a fair trial? There's been so little accountability for what's happened. You know, we t I, I, I talk about this being the, the, uh, the biggest case that's come to the federal court since the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti in 19, the 1920s. They were both executed. They were Italian immigrants. They were anarchists. They were, they were accused of murder. And a half century later, the governor of Massachusetts uh, commuted Harvey, it was commuted, I think, exonerated them, uh, ruling that they had had an unfair trial. And it was clearly an unfair trial. And so sympathy, I have no sympathy for him, but I think it is vitally important that he receive a fair trial. And the tragedy here, in my mind, is that we have not had the kind of judge that we saw with Mark Wolf, who had the absolute courage in 19, uh, 96 after the, the indictment, 96 after Flemmy and Bulger took off, Flemmy was uh, arrested, to launch hearings and to force out the secret that might still be a secret today if Wolf hadn't forced it out, that there were two FBI informants. And, and that, we could have had, a, we could have had that, that accountability that you talk about, Dick, you know, wanting to know what about all the other people who were involved in this. And so sympathy, I don't think there's sympathy, but we got to make sure the trial is done right and fairly. What do you mean? In other words, he saw every, whenever you see Buddy Bulger, you hear the name Southwest. It's like he's a product. Peter's, Peter's wiser in those ways, but I think Peter would tell you that that Southie it does not exist today. It, well, it doesn't, but you'll find people. You'll find people who, I mean, it's the reason when you were talking about Conley and being fascinated about why Conley uh, hasn't reacted or what his reaction is to being thrown under the bus. David and I have spoken about this. You know, I don't think, I think he was so entrenched in the identity that he had of the city and being wired into Bulger and what that meant vis-a-vis -vis the whole Irish-Italian thing, that I just don't think he has, he's been able to, to sort of confront the truth about it. I mean, maybe he will at some point, but, but even that, like even that, even that like kind of ridiculous uh, movie idea he had at that time. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. you like to have been in the room when he got the news about what Whitey is no. saying about him? But I mean, you know, I, I, you know, he's had he's had what? He's had 13 years now to to think hard about it, and yet, you know, at the end of that, he gets this. He gets this final kind of coup de gras, and we still haven't heard from him. Right. You know, and he's got a lot to say. I mean, I, I gotta believe <laughs> he could he could alter the landscape here in a lot of ways. But but if if he wanted to. Any other questions in the room? Front row here. the Boston office and maybe their recourse in D.C.? I mean, you think it, it does. goes yeah. to like the Attorney General's office? Boy, it, you know, the, the history of this is, the history of this is, again, there's a reason I call it the longest running saga in the English language. But so much of this starts with, with J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover and the Kennedys. They, they, there was an animosity between them. Hoover 
had always maintained there was no such thing as the syndicate, as a national crime organization. Bobby Kennedy was ruthless in pursuing enemies that would advance Jack's political career, one of them being Jimmy Hoffa. And Bobby Kennedy wrote this book called The Enemy Within, which was about organized crime. And so when, when it became clear there was syndicated, a syndicate, there was a mafia, um, the Kennedys tried to embarrass Hoover. Pretty soon, the Kennedys are elected. Bobby becomes the attorney general. He launches the war on organized crime. And for political survival, all of a sudden, Hoover embraces it. And in 1960, in, in 1960, there were very few there in, in New York, there might have been four guys pursuing organized crime. They were all pursuing communists to the extent, as John Connolly himself once said, back in the days I started, you'd go to a commie cell block meeting, there'd be 12 of them and there'd be 11 of us as <laughs> undercover agents. And so suddenly the mafia became the new communism and there that was the political directive. The war was launched in Boston. Mafia was the target. And it didn't matter that the mafia was relatively small here, but they empowered the Irish gangs. And, and so, yeah, there's a huge backstory here. Huge, uh, and it climbs up. I have a question. Well, uh, hang on, wait, we have a bunch of questions, so let me just Sorry. go around, make a round. I have three quick questions. Who's paying for the defense? Will Catherine Grigg testify? Mm -hmm. And will there be any room for the public to watch the trial? We're paying for the defense, right? We're paying for the defense. <laughs> okay. Um, All of us together. Yeah. yeah. And she's not, I don't think Catherine Gregg's expected to testify at all. No. Uh, and there is um, a carefully orchestrated seating chart and seating plans where there'll be room for the public in the courtroom. There's two overflow courtrooms, which I think should probably be pretty easy to get in and out of to watch it on, yeah. on TV. But probably more demand than supply, most likely. I pr it, would, it depends. I think when, when Mr. Bulger takes the stand, yeah. <laughs> There'll be lines outside the federal courthouse. I have a sort of stupid, embarrassing question, but could you just explain what racketeering means? Ah, the rac RICO, racketeering enterprise. Okay. Um, it's, how, how old, what is it? Uh, it they, they used it with, against the Anjulos in the mid-'80s. I think it's in the, from the early 80s, a new federal statute where you can um, go after a criminal organization a syndicate, a racketeering enterprise. Um, and to do that, it's a bit of a catch-all, and Harvey would know this far better, Harvey Silvergate, far, far better me, than me. But you can, you have to prove a, uh, just at least two predicate acts, extortion, can I, can loan charges. Can I from it? Are you wondering what even basic racketeering is? Like what? Well, in, this in this legal yeah. context. Yeah. The 19 murders are, are, are some of the, yeah, the 19 murders that he's charged with are not, it's not just a, mur it's not a murder case, it's a racketeering case. And, and the criminal acts that make up the racket uh, include uh, charges of 19 murders, there's loan sharking, extortion, and uh, the benefit of the racketeering enterprise is that on some of these crimes, these so-called predicate crimes, their statute of limitations might have exhausted a long time ago, but if you're proving a racketeering enterprise, I think you can reach back in time and proven gambling from the early 80s and have it be... Uh, the, difference between the, uh, the difference between the Boy Scouts and the Mafia is that they're both organizations. One is considered a, uh, well, generally one is considered a corrupt organization. The other one isn't. <laughs> and so you need to prove that it's a bad organization and these people have come together for bad purposes. And they've, they've, they have committed a certain uh, number, a minimum number of bad acts together. How do they do, Harvey? No, that's good. Wait, that, uh, uh, let's, yeah. let's get Harvey. How are we doing, Harvey? That, that's not quite right. What, what it really is, and you know, without going to a lot of legalese, the murder is not a federal crime. In order for the feds to get the FBI going after murderers and to get the federal courts to prosecute murderers, they have to show there's an impact on interstate commerce. That means the ordinary murderer is of no interest to the feds. But the organized murder syndicate that somehow impacts interstate commerce, that is a federal interest. And that's what this is really all about. The reason that these federal trials are so complicated and uh, uh, difficult to understand is because they're not ordinary murder cases. If this case were tried in Suffolk Superior Court, it would take three weeks 
three weeks. This is going to take six months. And the reason is it's not a murder case. It's a racketeering case, and racketeering is defined as interfering with interstate commerce. Nothing is direct in the federal criminal justice system. Which, which gives us a backdrop, by the way, of this case. What you need to understand, and, and Harvey and I have talked about this before, you need to understand that this is not, this, this trial should not be considered as a, as a starting and ending point, really. Because, because James Bulger is headed south. He is on a highway that's going to take him south. There are two states, Florida and Oklahoma, that both are enthusiastic about the death penalty, and they're both enthusiastic about seeking it against him. He's charged with murders in two states. And as Harvey said, uh, murder is a state crime. It's not a federal crime unless they've now defined it in certain cases. If you kill a political official and other things, it's, they federalized it. But those two cases are much more straightforward. This one is long. It's drawn out. It delays the road south. And really, the defense here is as much interested is the chances of, he's facing overwhelming odds. But anything that the defense can do to cause a mistrial, uh, to, cause, to cause a mistrial, uh, to delay, to have a hung jury, anything they do is a victory of sort because it slows the road south. I want to pause for a minute because we wanted to show you a little piece of what launches tomorrow on WBUR.org. This is the project David's been immersed in for weeks and months to try to create sort of a definitive online guide to this trial. So, David, I'll let you give a little quick tour of what people can find. Now, this gets unrolled in stages. The first stage right, comes out yeah. tomorrow morning. So, so what, what we've, uh, we've decided is essential to the public here is a program guide, an interactive program guide as in get your program here. You know, if you're going to a play, if you're going to a game, you need a program to know the players, what they look like, what their numbers are, what their stats are, what the history is, what the scenery <laughs> is, and who's in the cast. So what we have done is we put together this interactive site. It is going to start tomorrow with a criminal narrative, and it's going to provide you with photos, stories, audio, video of all the, uh, the families of the, of the victims. We also have all sorts of public documents. If you want to read Judge Wolf's 661-page report, it's on the site. If you want to read the confidential DEA 6, in which Flemmy talks about his criminal history, it's still considered confidential, that's on the site. We have uh, arrest records, profiles of the trial, of the families, of the witnesses, uh, and it's, it's going to be a very rich, rich, rich site. We'll do that. Op we'll open it fully when opening arguments start. But tomorrow morning, you'll be able to go and see a picture of almost every one of the 19 victims and learn about his family and the, and the results. And also, I think we have a little snippet of the Discovery Investigation yeah, movie I based see, on yeah. Dick's book. That's right. That, do we have a little piece of that? We do, have a little piece we do, and we should, yeah. When you're ready, we should show, we should show that. That's, Dick, you want to talk about that? And, and, and well, Susan. Should, I think uh, Susan actually, yeah. Here. But I, I, the nice thing about BUR, again, it's a public service. I think this hopefully will get the reputation uh, ar around the country, even the world. Anyone who needs to know anything about the Whitey Bulger trial, this is the go-to place. That's, that's what I think their goal was, and I think, I think they're pulling it off based on hearing what David's been working on for the last few months. They should figure out a way to monetize it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's been a, most of this project has been in my barn for years. I mean, it's 25 years of... Uh, of files and files and files that I saved, and, and never knowing what that was going to happen to them, but they're now on the site largely. It's and the, uh, the the movie? Do we have the little movie? We do have a little excerpt? movie. I just wanted to know if you wanted to take any questions. Before well, I wonder if we want to watch the movie briefly. How, how, long, is it, how long will it take? In, yeah. It's two and a half Susan minutes. Sure. We'll watch a little Susan bit, and, and then we can see if there are any final questions. Terrific. People have based okay. on that. Great. So you get to see this two hours before it airs nationally. That's right. It's going to be on at 10 o'clock tonight on Investigation Discovery, which is part of the Discovery Network. Uh, and it's a quick excerpt from 
Mark, can you hit those lights so we can if we yeah. we can dim it a little bit? Do you want to talk, Susan, Ben, do you want to sort of address some of the, 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 uh, the issue of, of translating this? Uh, I can start. This was made for Investigation Discovery, which is the crime channel of Discovery. And believe it or not, the viewership is female. It's, it's something like 70 to 80 percent female. So uh, it worked out well for us in that Dick's book told the story more of Whitey, and it was more for sort of a biogra biographical sketch that people didn't know. And it allowed us to talk about the girlfriends and the personal life and his son. And interestingly enough, that's what everybody's picking up now in all of the reviews. But uh, at the time we did it, they were feeling it's a very male story and it won't really play that well, so they kept us at 43 minutes, which is a television hour. <laughs> And now they're seeing all the play that it's getting and the people really are interested in the FBI story and the Billy story and the context and how it went so terribly wrong. And uh, they're regretting that decision, which is something you two don't know yet. <laughs> but we had just magnificent storytellers telling the stories you saw in the film and these two sitting in front of you and that really, and oh, Lindsay Sear who turned out to be a really great storyteller, the girlfriend of Whitey. Not really much to add. Uh, you know, this was really uh, a film about the you know the dark turning points in his life, much more than the kind of the macro political aspects that uh, that we've been talking about here. So I like going to these there. parties because I can go to these parties and see uh, on a good night at their at their parties I can I can see three Whitey Bulgers, a uh, Howie Winters, <laughs> and a couple of Stephen Flemings. <laughs> <laughs> Any young Lindsay Sear here. Yeah, <laughs> Lindsay Sear over there. Yes. <laughs> it started out that we weren't doing a lot of recreations, and they kept changing their minds, saying more, 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 more. So we apologize for all the recreations. That wasn't our choice. Any other general questions from the room? Yeah. Uh, as for the uh, FBI agent vulnerability, uh, I assume that there's not much uh, in terms of uh, criminal uh, charges that could that are likely to be uh, brought. The, uh, but, uh, could they have civil or uh, possibly administrative? Uh, it's exposure? interesting. Well, early on, early on, uh, it the determination was made that there were that the statute of limitations, the statute of limitations had run out on most of those crimes. Uh, now it so happened that a number of those crimes weren't <coughs> known because the FBI withheld the information of some of those crimes until they had run out. That's, that's, that's the accusation. Uh, there is one, Dick, do you, have you come across this? I mean, there, there, one way that possibly some crimes could be opened here or explored is if it's determined that there is a continuing, uh, a continuing conspiracy, especially in that it involves murder. It would keep it open. But who's gonna do that? Well, that's it. Who is going to do that? Because you need to have political will and, and, and maybe, again, this is wishful thinking, but, uh, and this echoes something um, yeah. uh, David was saying earlier in terms of responding to s sympathy for Whitey, but there may be no sympathy. I think the, well, you know, it's, uh, the evidence is overwhelming, but I really want to see Jay Carney bang on the government as hard as they can, uh, to test the government as hard as they can, to make the government make its case uh, of all this overwhelming evidence. And in that process, if it draws a new kind of heat, a new spotlight to some of these other um, uh, FBI agents and, and, and involvement in, in crimes, maybe there becomes, you start to develop a, a reason to have to go in those directions. But right now, I don't know who would do that. I don't think, it, I think it's, a, it, it, it's over. Well, well my, my question was basically, uh, where would the families have some recourse of, of the victims? And also, uh, I know in the military, uh, if you have some misconduct when you're in the military, they can reduce your retirement pay uh, administratively. 
is there some possible chance that that could happen to some of the FBI agents involved for their retirement or benefits? You know, it's all, I think you have one or two prosecutors who would like to see people brought to account, and they still hope that they might be able to bring people to account. Again, I think the way prosecutors see it is they would have to be a tie to an ongoing conspiracy that would then no longer, it would transcend the statute of limitations and allow them to go back and charge. But there is, there's been very little, I mean, we do not have, there's only, there's only been one Judge Wolf in this story, and he was fabulous at the time. And then, unfortunately, when Bulger came back, and when Bulger was arrested in 2011 and came back, uh, he ended up in the courtroom of Judge Wolf, but the government wanted to steer the, the, the case away from Judge Wolf because he had been so ferocious in conducting hearings that opened everything up. Harvey loves to say that uh, he turned the rocks over and, and revealed the maggots when he did that in the 1990s. And so he was essentially, he was essentially steered away from the case. So he, he could not preside over this trial. And what we saw instead was it went to Judge Richard Stearns. Stearns was removed. It was an extraordinary decision by the, by the Court of Appeals. Stearns himself refused to, to recuse himself, and finally he was removed. But all of the damage was done by that point. He had made rulings that this judge did not overturn. So we have not had another Judge Wolf in this case. Mm -hmm. how, many, uh, the as far as the F how many of the original players as far as the FBI um, or folks that were sort of on the job back when Whitey was doing his thing are still with the government, still working today? Uh, the five or six names that come to my mind, they're all retired, so they're not active agents. But there's, but there's only one person, and this is extraordinary, and because we tend to look at the lower down people who might be responsible. We're looking at, you know, the guys out on the street or just above them. We, we haven't seen, we really haven't really gone to the top of the J Department of oh, Justice. I agree, and, that's and there's one guy, David Margolis, who has been in that position for 48 years. He knows the secrets. Well, and I think the next question to that is, I mean, could this happen again? Does the FBI now have systems and checks and balances where this wouldn't happen? Could it still be happening? Well, the, I mean, the, 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 the classic example is a guy named Rossetti, Mark Rossetti. Uh, Mark Rossetti was a major drug dealer. My information was he was informant for the FBI back in 1990. Uh, and meanwhile, a couple of years ago, the, the, the state police were following him. He was a suspect. He was one of the top figures in organized crime here. And as the FBI is following him, uh, they're recording conversations he's having with the FBI. So the state police are following him, and they realize, wait a minute, he's working for the FBI. <laughs> Sounds like the James Whitey Bulger story all over again. So. Dick, what do you think? Is it uh, possible that we still have a? Yeah, I mean, the Rossetti thing is, is you know, reason for concern. Um, you know, the informing guidelines, the rules of the road back w um, during the Whitey years, they look pretty good on paper. Um, they involved that, you know, the agent handler wouldn't be out there alone to get caught up with, with, the, with the informant, in this case, Whitey, and get too close because there was the, F, the, the squad supervisor was supposed to supervise that. But then that supervisor is the corrupt agent, John Morris, who's brought in into the, in, into the, into the circle. Uh, so that's how it, it <coughs> broke down. Um, you know, Don Stern uh, with, makes, uh, uh, has spoken a lot about, he was the former U.S. Attorney, US attorney during, you know, the, in the 80s, um, about reforms in the informant handling rules at the FBI that um, were supposed, I mean, hopefully have made a difference in the sense that uh, there, I think a prosecutor, there's a role for a prosecutor, some Justice Department person, outside pair of eyes to, to, to oversee and have a, have a role in monitoring the ongoing informant relationships that the FBI traditionally has always had. Not single case informants, but long-term relationships, which is where a lot of the trouble happens because you develop relationships. But whether that's made a difference, I don't know. It's all happening in, in you know, secrecy as it's supposed to. So, it's one but, of the, yeah. but it, it, on paper, it looks better than it does before. Mm -hmm. uh, let me take a new question right here. I'm wondering about Brother Billy. <laughs> Brother Billy, is he, he 
kind of arrogant and hard hitting in his own way. What is his role? I didn't see his name on the witness list. I'm sure it's not on the witness list, but you just kind of wonder. For the defense, it didn't show up. Dick spent a lot of Dick spent a lot of time in this in this recent book on on Bill. You want to talk about? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a one of the. I mean, I think it's definitely a theme in the book. Is the so it's it runs throughout, but really tracking the relationship, and not just something that we know in sort of real time now, but going back back years and, and looking at the uh, roots of it and, and really adding some meat to the notion that they've always been, you know, that they're loyal to each other. Um, and I think, you know, that little excerpt talked about the bank robbery uh, arrest in the 1950s when Whitey did it go away to prison for a while. And now what emerges from the records that we were able to get and, and to use in the biography, it's stunning how Bill Bulger at such an early time, Whitey's 26, Bill's in college at Boston College, it's not the father, it's not the mother, it's not the oldest sister in the family, it's not anyone else. It's Bill Bulger who emerges as what we call Whitey's advocate in chief, you know, pulling the strings of power wherever he can and, and, and uh, really working on his behalf from, from way back when. Uh, there's a loyalty that's, that's really documentable at this point. And, and it, it was always, he benefited from, he was given a bubble to operate in this city for, for decades, you know, what his connection to his, how deep his connection is to his brother and how much his involvement with his brother and his brother's enterprises. I don't pretend to know, I, 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 I've, I've never known. I think people want to jump to that conclusion. But what's always been stunning to me is the amount of willful ignorance that seems to be at play here. When you're the president of the Senate, you get to be the president of the Senate because you know where every vote is. You know what everything is, everything that's happening under that building. And certainly, you know everything that's happened in your city. So when you have a major drug epidemic in, in, in your town, when kids are jumping off buildings into their suicides, and your brother is suspected and widely suspected of supplying the poison that's killing the community, and you say you have no idea, it's stunning. Uh, when uh, I, full disclosure here, I had a cousin who worked for the DEA. My cousin uh, followed Bulger along with a couple of good cops in the 80s. They said to Whitey, every day Whitey drove from his house over to East Third Street and parked in front of Bill Bulger's house. He went into Bill Bulger's house during the day, and then later on, uh, he met with Stephen Fleming across the way, and sometimes they met with Bill Bulger. Now, I'm sorry, but if my brother is showing up at my house every day and I'm off at work, I think my wife would tell me, and I think I'd have a concern. And when my, if, if, if your brother's business partner, who is corrupt, decides to move next door, to the Senate President's house, do you think you might be concerned? <laughs> I mean, there are numbers, and this all ended, of course, ingloriously for the Senate President because he was in Washington, and they asked him questions, and the only way he got by those questions by saying, I don't know, I don't remember, and playing Mickey the Dunce. When they asked him if, and, and by the way, and he was Senate President when President Reagan's Organized Crime Commission named his brother a reputed killer and mob boss in Boston. He claimed not to know this. And so he was playing Mickey the dunce. And you wonder how much more. Uh, one sort of closing question. You know, given the enormous amount of evidence and the witnesses, is it almost a foregone conclusion that Whitey Bulger will be convicted of something and maybe enough things to essentially have a life in prison sentence given his age? And is it more trial, more about accountability? How much can we piece together that we don't know but in the end, it will end badly for him. Yeah, I think it's over for him. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and then, and and like I said, I'm, you know, it's the confrontations between him and his cohorts, his former cohorts, uh, government officials, um, to see in, in in a new stage. And I think with, you know, a burning spotlight in a way that 
again, a lot of these civil trials were really important. It happened, but no one was really paying attention in the last 10 years in the families' cases against the government. Where they but, sometimes got big money. And Yeah, they did get big money, but a lot of the stuff that I think is so jaw-dropping played out to very, to very few in the audience, and the press had kind of moved, wasn't really covering it. This is going to be different. Some of this will be rehashed, but hopefully it'll be some new stuff, uh, and, there, and there may be a, you know, uh, you know, a, a fuller picture and a, 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 you know, this, some more accountability. This will, end, this will end with the U.S. attorney in Boston uh, standing beside the head of the FBI here and declaring victory, vindication and victory from two rogue FBI agents. They'll, and they will say that the long national nightmare has ended. You know, the old Nixon line, the long national nightmare has ended. Uh, and the families who have been put through hell, I mean, the, what the families have been subjected to, to, to is just, it's, it's utterly unbelievable and reprehensible. And that's why I think their stories have to be at the center of this because of how they indict the government. Many of them will be thrilled that this is over and he's been convicted. Uh, and you know, that will be it. Maybe there'll be some reversible issues or whatever. Bulger will be on his way south and, um, you know, to continue the process. But unfortunately, in his wake, I don't think we are going to have the accounting, the true accounting that we need in this case. So I know a lot more of you have questions. I don't know what availability is after this panel, but I think that for a while there may be a chance to ask Dick and David questions, maybe David Frank, maybe Harvey Silverglade, maybe Peter Galsinis in the back of the room. Um, this WBUR.org uh, massive project goes live tomorrow, and we'll, uh, Asma Khalid, one of our young reporters, will be live blogging throughout the court, so you can see that. Uh, again, 10 o'clock tonight, if you want to see that full movie, that's tonight. So I think we should call it quits, but feel free to stay later and sort of try to corner some of the folks in the room who can answer some of your questions. And thanks to everybody who came out tonight. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Asher. Okay.